try to live by the gun, or you die by the sword. Welcome to the Good, the Bad, the Weird Microviews. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And today we are taking a look at the 2011, what I'll call a kind of monumental documentary for us. Yes. A widely renowned documentary, Euro Dreams of Sushi. This was, I think for a lot of people, the start of the at-home, like, document watching. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, like, now there's, it's, it's fairly well known that there's like whole streaming services dedicated to watching just documentaries netflix pretty regularly puts out quite a few like even sponsors a whole bunch but that wasn't always the case there used to be kind of like a pretty good dry spell where good documentaries just kind of showed up on tv Mm -hmm. or you had to like really seek them out they weren't just like presented to the general public yeah whereas this one um I think it was 2013 Netflix decided to stick its logo on it, stick it on the front page, and everyone saw this movie. Yes. I I mean, I remember seeing it probably through Netflix as well, because I was going through a a documentary uh, phase as well in my watching career. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, it it definitely was different. Also, I think it was like the first time any of us had really set out to watch a documentary on food making yes and like now that's not like super uncommon there's there's quite a few um but this was especially for food that was like not historical food or like this is like ho- or home network kind of stuff yeah like this is current like current history defining people in food mm-hmm. which for the general for general people like you don't know who those chefs are you don't know especially from other countries yeah so this really did a great job of like being both incredibly informative not talking down to its audience and also like letting a lot of people in on a different culture yes and it it wasn't done in kind of a cheesy way like i don't know if you remember the show iron chef oh are you kidding <laughs> do i remember i still watch it i don't i don't know what people watch no i but no back i then. i agree like for a long time a lot of people's idea of food documentary was like anthony bourdain yeah which don't be wrong i love him and i loved his show but he is not necessarily a great like introduction into the culture of a food okay. into what like into what that food means for the person themselves. You were watching it as Anthony Bourdain, as someone who most people could somewhat relate to and put themselves like, he's from New York, I kind of mm-hmm. know what his palate is, I know that he has a great background, so I trust his point of view. Whereas this, there's not like... Like, we have a food critic who comes in to help with the documentary. Yeah. But we are not taking their food critic point of view. Like, we are just talking to the chef and his sons. For the most part. And the food critic, I'll say in this one, is it seems very biased because it's the only critic review we get in yeah. the entire movie. So <laughs> yeah, it's like... That's true. But at the same time, we also get, like, like it's not focused on the experience. Like, it, it's, a, it's an interesting take on food mm-hmm. from a documentary point of view because it's not focused on like the production of the food as in like normally like normally it's like uh, oh see where the rice is grown see? yeah like, yeah it does a great job of addressing those issues but it's not like that's not the sole purpose of it its sole purpose is this art of sushi mm-hmm. which yeah. hadn't really been talked about or covered before yeah because i think for the most part most of our sushi is like sushi we get at a grocery store, Costco. the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, gr- granted, I, I I have a little bit good background because like the grocery store in Alaska brought in like a legitimate like sushi chef who sure. had been doing that for his career. <laughs> so, but like I think the average watcher in America up until this movie mm-hmm. did not know what it took to be a sushi chef. It didn't know how much time went into it. In the idea of like how each piece is presented and why that level of detail would even be considered yeah hadn't really ever been discussed outside of like actual chefs 
Okay. And, and like people who are actively looking into it. Like this was presented just the average viewer as like a, hey, you want to watch a cool documentary? And people are like, yeah. And then suddenly people are being exposed to this, not just different concept of like food and cuisine, but also like this documentary does such a great job of explaining like why some of the mindsets are the way they are. Why yeah. why Jiro has or favors certain ways of doing things and why that's hard to do now. Like explaining that like it takes a very long time and traditionally and with the Japanese culture that was like something that continued on. Why his son has kept working for him for so goddamn long and i'll get into that in a little bit um i actually have restructured our micro view for this one a little bit yes. just so that way it's a little more organized since this kind of bounces around a bit it does um but euro dreams of sushi is directed by david uh, gelb uh it stars jiro ono uh yasukazu ono uh masuhiro yamamoto all as themselves obviously of course um but I wanted to bring up Gleb a little bit because he's done quite a bit of documentary work. He has. Um, I'm fairly familiar with those. Including a few episodes on Chef's Tables, but he's also done some Marvel work. Uh, yeah, a little bit. He did some work with Obi-Wan Kenobi, A Jedi's Return, and I think a couple other Marvel documentaries. Yes. But the uh -huh. only work I know of Gleb's uh, outside of Euros yeah. is... His directorial work on the Lazarus Effect. Oh yes, <laughs> he directed. I didn't. I was not expecting to see that on his yes I filmography. Think he, I think he also worked on the menu, which if you haven't seen, you would. Know. I have seen the menu. He did not. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, no, I I absolutely adored the menu. I've okay. seen it twice, and it's been less than a year <laughs> that it, since it came out. Partly because your husband had us watch. That it. makes sense. Um. But I do actually have some outside resources for this episode. Um, they, the only outside resource I had at this time was the uh, the Sukabayashi Jiro Restaurant website, uh, yasushi Jiro yeah. jp and I'm probably butchering the names. But, um, but yeah, and for this episode, we actually have a little small drink for this. We do. We have this uh, nice plum wine that I've got. It's this umeboshi plum wine. Delicious. That is delicious. Much better than the stuff we normally get, isn't it? That is, yeah. yeah. I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Hero Dreams of Sushi. I kind of want to start off with talking about the documentary itself. Yes. I do like it's set up with all the awards up front and the slow motion of making the sushi. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. As well as an overall style, I like the simple tags they use for everything. It really adds to like that level of elegance that we think of when we think of high end. Yes, we and I think from the get go, this documentary does a really good job of like embodying that idea of like elegance and simplicity throughout. Mm -hmm. um, because it's the it introduces itself with its awards and titles, like you said, it's got the beautiful slow mos of the sushi being made. In a very artsy way. And on top of that, all of the music for this from the get-go is either classical or from the composer um, Philip Glass. And okay. all of his work... First off, you should know that he's well-known enough that my husband from a different room heard one of the pieces <laughs> playing and walks in and goes, Is that the minimalist composer Philip Glass? Oh my god. <laughs> and I went... I don't know. And then, like, immediately afterwards, the director, was, in his commentary on the DVD, was explaining his choice. Um, Philip Glass is, a, is thought of as a minimalist composer. And so part of the reason why that music is so part of, like, so perfect. Yeah. And then, but, we, it, but we're introduced with, I think it's, it's either Trzaski or Mozart at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, well-known classical music <laughs> there's only uh i and i noted that the music was nice and orchestral but i don't know much much about it but uh there is one piece i reckon i recognize uh -huh. yo yo maz yeah yeah whatever <laughs> cover of some beethoven song or something that he's known for that that's like the only thing i knew from the yeah. music of this yeah that, yeah <laughs> uh but i'm glad someone was able to pick out something nice about it yes um 
but part of what I like about the documentary from the get-go is, and just throughout it and overall, is while the documentary does focus on Euro, um, it and also his restaurant a little bit, it's also more about the industry as well, because I think this documentary is, what, like an hour, 15 minutes at most? Yeah, I mean, it's, for a documentary, it's a good length, but it's by no means, like, getting too long. Yeah, hour 21. Yeah. But I also like that they segmented out a little bit where it's all about the it's all about setting up the history of Euro and mm -hmm. like everything that's going on around him. Um, and then it spends a little bit of time. It doesn't harp on it too much, but they talk about like the ta at the tail end of the documentary, the changing of the industry and the yeah. quality that isn't the same anymore, as well as like. You can't get the same type of cuts anymore as you could back in the day. Like yeah, like the world is changing. Some of the fish aren't available anymore, and we and we as a pair have unfortunately seemed to chose a theme of changing and dying worlds yeah. over the last few months. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, it's it, it's fine, but yeah, it it just the way and we we talked about it a little bit in our uh, the Grim Sleeper episode mm, yes where we talked about how like documentaries are set up in a way to educate but also kind of form a thesis yes and i think that is lost a little bit on euro yes i think that is where the documentary portion of the film isn't super strong mm -hmm. like i like at its heart it is a documentary but it spends a lot of time and effort focused on the character of Jiro. Yes. And his values and his way of life, kind of. Yeah, and kind of like this level of perfectionism of sushi that doesn't, it, that, it, do, it it's good for what it is. Yes. But it's one of those documentaries where... You're not the, necessarily learning. No, a new f new source. No, not a whole lot. It, it it it's it's a very narrow focus, yes. and which is good. And it I I like that it does kind of serve as kind of like this opening, uh, opening course on the subject matter. And it's kind of funny that you say it's a narrowed in view because originally it wasn't meant to be. Originally, oh. the idea the director had was that they were going to travel around potentially the world mm. looking at sushi and like how it is in different places, how different um, sushi chefs handle it, how it changes from location to location. And the food critic that we meet in the film... Uh, introduced the director to Jiro and after they ate there for the first time he's like never mind my whole film is going to be about this okay well that makes sense um which that leads me to the next part I wanted to talk about was Jiro as a character and his family and staff yes um which they do a great job of setting up the dedication of his life to the mastery of the skill uh Part of why I think this is such a driving documentary because of the dedication and passion. Mm -hmm. And this is the part from learning that he left home. And I mean, we, we learned early on that he left home at nine. And it's quite the rags to riches story. It, it really, yes. And I like that they spend just enough time explaining his background. But they do not spend a great deal of time harping on it. Mm -hmm. Like they give you a quick like photo of him as a very young child and they give kind of a quick explanation of like where that is located like where that's located mm -hmm. what it takes to get started but the whole focus isn't on like the journey of his life it's used more as an explanation of who he is today and what drove him to do or become a profession or master his craft exactly um but i also think part of the reason this documentary stuck so well with a uh, western audience is because it really resonates with the embodiment of american culture of like oh, yes. you, you can go from nothing to being the this... literally one of the greatest in the world exactly um and th that's one thing that they do put the put an emphasis on in the documentary they call it the uh, spirit of Sho shokuni Shokunin. Uh, and for us, I mean, we we don't know 
what that word is, generally, unless you look it up. And yes. that that's the one fault in this documentary, is they bring a bunch of terms that don't <laughs> translate to us at all. Yeah, that is that is one of the things that, like, why I say you don't necessarily learn a whole lot from this documentary compared to others, is, like, this documentary is so focused on him and his craft that they don't spend a great deal of time, like, explaining the actual sushi and terms around it. Yes. Because, like, they, and they, it's not like they ignore it. Like, they do explain some, but it's not enough for you to feel like you have gained any expertise in the area. Well, and part of that is because Yuro only does nigiri sushi, so he doesn't even go, like, That's, down a hole, rabbit hole. It's, it's a very narrow type of sushi it as is, well. No, it is, but on top of that, like, the documentary doesn't, ex- like, bother to explain that at all. Like, if you were someone who wasn't familiar with Japanese cuisine and sushi in general... Mm-hmm. Like, there is a very, like, you would come away from this documentary assuming that all sushi in Japan looks like this. And we'll get to that in a (laughs) bit. Um, But for those who don't know, uh, Shokunin is, uh, it's based, it translates to an artisan who's mastered the profession similar to in a tour in film. Yes. Um, But. The documentary does kind of explain that, like, it takes about 10 years to do this yes and i do think that they do a good job of explaining like there's a huge amount of dedication needed to do what he has done it explain it says 10 years if you're an apprentice that's true there's more to it than that though yes because i mean it 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 starts over it's before it even gets into that like it really talks about like the shot the overshadowing of that euro has on the whole yes sushi scene i guess and also his children as well yeah one who's been forced out of the restaurant the youngest i think Mm -hmm. and then the oldest who's has to stay and can't open his own restaurant because he's supposed to take over what his father's established also should add that this restaurant is a three-star michelin restaurant not anymore i I have that for the end (laughs) okay yes um i do i do think though that one of the praises i will give is it does do a good job of Without explaining too much history, Mm -hmm. it does a nice, respectful job of explaining, like, him and his family are very traditionally Japanese. And so that's, they they go on to explain, like, the reasoning that the family holds this idea that the younger son has had to go off and do his own thing while the oldest stays in an apprenticeship under his father, even though... I think his son's, like, 60 in this movie. Yeah, I don't know, because... Like, he's, he's by no means, like, a young man. <laughs> well, I don't I don't think he's that old, because in... It, I mean, he's... Euro's 87 in this film. 85. 85. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Re- I, I, I don't know. They they didn't really go... That's the thing, is they don't really go into this, so, like, you really want to know everything about them, you have to do a lot of research on the side. And even then, there's not a ton available yeah. on them, like, on their personal lives, which is fine. Like, they're not meant to become celebrities no. based off of this. But, like, I I do appreciate that the film does a very courteous job of explaining, like, they hold these traditional views. So, like, while the son has had his rebellious moments, like, he he also holds those same values. And that's yeah. why he has stayed. That's why he's continued on and why he... Like, he he would love to see his father retire, but he also knows that his father will not retire. <laughs> exactly. That's the part of the dedication that's supposed to be, like, yeah. the, the big driving force behind this documentary. And, yeah, it just, it's it's the shadow that Euro casts over the entire thing. Um, over the industry, really. Because, like, they even, like, bring in and talk to some of the vendors that deal with him. And, yes. like, his Rife's vendor, like, has declared like i won't sell this specific rice to anyone but him Mm -hmm. because i don't think they know how to even cook it yeah and there's only one specific like fishmonger that they go to who hand selects their tuna yeah like like this man has had a a huge impactful reach um across quite a few areas Mm -hmm. and like part of like they they don't harp on it but it is something that like I found interesting from it because it's something that we're experiencing now here in America is this like idea of like the older generation not retiring. Yeah. When especially Jiro is uh, an outlier. The man is 
very old, and I have still not found anything saying that he has since retired. No, he's still alive, and he's 97 at the time of recording this. Yes, and as far as I can tell, still involved in his restaurant. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Because they even bring up he had a heart attack at, like, what, 75? Yeah, man just kept going. Yeah, exactly. Man closed for, like, a day, and then was like, I'm back. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, so, like, when they're talking to all of these other industries that he's had a hand in, like, his way of thinking and his morales of, like, I try to never miss a single day of work. I try to, like, I have worked very hard for this. I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. There's a level of perfectionism that has to be in everything I do. That mindset is affecting everyone around him because a lot of these vendors occasionally would be like, yeah, I'm thinking about retiring. I'm getting kind of getting kind of tired, but like, man, your dad, he's still going. So maybe I should. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm <sighs> it, it's a very interesting point of view because like there is like I admire him for whole, like not just like, reaching this level of perfection and master mastering this skill, mm-hmm. but also like. He clearly enjoys it enough that he's not retiring. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm i in the same boat, too. I mean, I've always said it since... Actually, I probably started saying it when I was in high school, is that I don't really plan on retiring. I I plan on working and keeping doing something until I until the day I die, because oh, otherwise sure. life's boring as shit. Well, yeah, but, but I, think, I think, especially in America, the idea for a long time was like, oh, well, when I reach retirement age of my current career, I'll pick up something new. Or I'll yeah. sidestep into something similar, but in, like, a new position. Yeah. That, that for a long time, was the mindset. And now we're seeing with the older generations this, like, no, I have reached a perfection in this craft. I'm going to keep going. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't feel like I need to slow down. I don't feel like I need to take a break. I've reached a peak. Why wouldn't I stay? Why yeah. wouldn't I continue to, like, try and beat my own record, beat like, my own level? Well, and that's a hard thing, too, is because the longer he goes, the more renowned he's going to get. Because, okay, this man is, who's the second almost he, 100 years old say, is... The second he hits 100, if he doesn't make sushi, <laughs> <laughs> like, he will be world-breaking twice over at, by then, if you know, he makes it to that. Keep going if he does. Yeah, like, at this point, why would you stop? <laughs> Can he stop? I don't think he can. Death is the only thing that will stop him. I think you're right. And even then, <laughs> death better be real permanent. <laughs> oh. But I do want to talk about the food in the restaurant a little bit. And the part of the reason I want to talk about the sushi itself is because while I did some of the digging on my own, mm-hmm. there's a lot that the documentary didn't explain other than that, A, it was simple, and B, it was delicious. And that's all they really harp on is, like, they yes. don't really go any th- over it any. Um, and they don't even really give any, like, explanation words too delicious they're just like it's so good (laughs) yeah and so that's one of the things too so the sushi euro makes is ito style sushi Mm -hmm. which there's no sharing of sake or conversing during the meal that's not really a big thing i guess um it's very like precise way of doing things well and it started because the origin of the sushi house was more of like a food stand as we would think of it nowadays uh yeah like a food like like a taco truck get your sit and get out exactly whereas the other style of eating came more from restaurants and pubs um the course itself is a 20 piece set of nigiri to be eaten right away which they do they they do kind of mention it but they don't really in the documentary of like how there's like a handful of people who they like interview that have eaten here Mm -hmm. at his restaurant and like several of them explain that like he i guess informs people when they come and sit down that he's like by the way when i serve you need to eat it right away immediately and so a lot of people i guess took that and got very nervous they're like i was shoveling my food down (laughs) (laughs) well and also like the website itself goes into like a step-by-step process on how to enjoy the food which i thought was a little over the top I agree, but I have seen a couple of videos from people who have eaten here that aren't necessarily, like, professional-level food mm-hmm. critics. They're just travelers who have gotten very lucky. And fun fact, there is a dress code to this place, too. Of fucking course there is. That they don't enforce, but they can't, they will kick you out if you aren't wearing X, Y, or Z. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, some of the people who I've seen that have had the chance to eat here have talked about how, like, 
there was a little bit of homework that they tried to do. And if they didn't necessarily get it right the first time, no one was necessarily mean. Mm -hmm. But, like, someone would come and explain, like, hey, you need to look at it first. You need to, like do a quick once over give it a quick little dunk if there is if there if that is sometimes it's yeah. not make sure you put the fish side down on your tongue like there was a whole process that thankfully for most people it sounds like was explained if you didn't already know yes because the other thing the movie doesn't ta- the documentary doesn't bring up at all is the entire time they're brushing the sushi with something yes and they're brushing it with uh nikiri soy sauce or uh nitsumi soy sauce I mean, the, um, the filmology of it is beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful, but it's done so that way there's no need to actually dip it. Yes, because on top of that, they explain that, like, the rice that he uses is so finely crafted that, like, dunking it would ruin it. Not just in, like, a, oh, you've ruined the pressure. No, like, it would fall apart. It's so lightly packed. Yeah, and well, and that's the thing they talk about, too, is, like, in the apprenticeship, like, you don't you don't start off learning to make everything like you're starting off like making the tamagoyaki you're making the rice and even then not even then you spend like an hour washing a like washing the octopus when you first start yeah it's all like learning the craft of it and that's why it takes 10 years of dedication and why they bring up that once you're done with it like you have the credentials to work anywhere and they bring like maybe one or two people in at who worked who were apprentices for a bit and even then they're like yeah it was tough he was a little mean at times but you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world kind of stuff. Yeah, um, they do several times throughout the documentary also, like, talk about how, like, they have a hard time finding new people to come work at the restaurant, mm-hmm. which is interesting to me because, like, there's him and his son. His oldest son works works there as, like, the second in command. Um, And then it kind of looks like there is, at best, room for, like, four other people in that kitchen. Yeah. So, like, they're theoretically turnover rate is real slow anyway despite Mm -hmm. the like lengthy process that would take to become a master in this craft well and on top of that too i don't know if this applies to the world of sushi but i know when i was watching a documentary on how sake is made is that they had a similar issue is they couldn't get young people because it's like a six-month process of like living in the brew house learning how like actually making the sake yeah and like the sake market in Japan is kind of dying out because of Western liquors like beer or whiskey and stuff that's sure. taking precedent over, or what, or even Western style beers that are taking precedent over the traditional sake method. Well, one of the difficulties that they explain is because Jiro is very traditionalist in this idea and in his perfectionism, he holds that all of his staff, it is a Monday through Saturday restaurant. Mm-hmm. Everyone only gets Sundays off. And on top of that, Monday through Saturday, you are eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the restaurant. You don't go home until it's dark, and you get there before the sun comes up. Yeah. Which, I understand, like, how that can lead to being the best in the world at the thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people would like to see their loved ones. Which is something that they very briefly touch on with his family. Yeah, and how hard it was for his kids when they were little. Yeah, because they're like, "Who's this strange man sleeping over at our house?" Like, yeah, well, and like it does very much seem that like his sons do didn't really know or appreciate him until they were full, like not even like, "Oh, I am nineteen and I'm an adult." Like, well into their thirties mm-hmm. before they like truly were like, "Okay, I'm I get it now." Yeah, yeah, you're you've been working for this one thing your entire life. Yeah, and it changes the dynamic of father son relationship to an ex- like quite a bit yeah and not necessarily not necessarily bad not necessarily wrong like the documentary does a great job of not necessarily like putting any narrative on that portion of his life mm-hmm. but it does kind of give me a little giggle when several times they're like man it's just so hard to find people to come work for me and i'm like yeah i bet <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of hard to find, uh, getting a seat at this restaurant's pretty hard. Uh, um, near impossible. Nowadays. Um, Even back then. Well, so the other thing, too, it's mentioned in the documentary that it's uh, 30,000 yen mm-hmm. uh, per, per per seating. Yes, per person. Uh, and it takes, like, I think they said it's only, like, a 15-minute dining experience. There um, is, like, some chit-chat afterwards. Like, you do get to, like, yeah. talk with him, and he explains, like, more about the process and the fish of the day and the menu that he set. Yes. But, like, the actual dining experience is very quick. It is. And 
that cost was about 228 US dollars back in 2011. Yeah. Uh, the menu now starts, and granted, this is all start, so it depends. It's all market price. That does make a big difference. So it's, according to their websites, it's 55,000 yen, Whew. which is about 415 US dollars last I checked. Um, on top of that, it's a 10 seat restaurant, which is kind of like the style of like a bar I'd like to own if I ever had one. And like 10 seat restaurants aren't uncommon in Japan. No. Like, that's pretty, that's not out of the world unheard of, but, like, this is, they are located inside a subway. Yeah. Like, this is not located in, like, a high-end luxury neighborhood. This is literally on a subway stop. Yeah. They they hype it up through it being a three-star Michelin restaurant, despite the low seat count and no restroom, which, as you mentioned earlier, it has lost its three-star status because it is almost impossible to get a seat in. And specifically, um, I'll get into that in just a second, because I do want to talk about kind of the post-documentary now. <laughs> I, I agree, because this documentary didn't just affect the viewers. It affected him as well. Yeah. So, like we mentioned, Euro is 97 at the time of this recording. Go, go man. And in Keep two, going. And in 2019, Suki Yabashi Euro was removed from the Michelin Guide because it was too difficult for regular persons to get a reservation in there, which, according to the CNN Travels, uh, Tokyo's famous... Uh, Sukibayashi Euro's uh, sushi restaurant removed from the mission guide by uh, Lilith Marcus. That, well, that's where I backed up my source, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, when I was looking at the website, the only way you can get a reservation is uh -huh. by call. They don't do it online anymore. Yeah. And the only way a foreigner can make a reservation is through the concierge of their hotel. So unless you've got some grand Budapest hotel level concierge services or the <laughs> cross keys bullshit. Yeah, like I said, I have gotten to watch a few vlogs, pretty much, of people who have gotten to eat here. And with the exception of one, mm -hmm. all of the ones that I watched were people who specialize in luxury travel, mm -hmm. plan years, like, years ahead of time for certain trips, and, like, this was no exception. And then the one, the one group that I did find that, like, didn't, do not normally fall into that category... Lived full time in Japan. Yep. Spoke fluent Japanese and had planned this sucker out ages in advance. Yeah, because uh, when I was also on the website, uh, they posted November fourth of two thousand twenty-two that they were not able to make reservations because they were booked until the middle of the next year. Yeah. Um. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. they're they're booked through with still July of this year, I guess. Uh, I have no doubt that that is the case. <laughs> And it should also be noted that in the documentary, they explain that it's not a one, once a day, 10 people get to eat. They do have three different times of the day that they that yeah. they do serve. But even then, that's only 30 people. And then his youngest son has gone on to create a sister franchise to this, but he wanted to hold similar ideas to his father. So his restaurant also seats an incredibly limited number of people. But a lot more than his father's, and he can't charge as much as his father because he's not his father. And even some of his father's regulars go to his son because his son's more affordable than his father. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but even then, the likelihood of you getting into that one, also very low. Yeah, which, I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, that's I how mean, it gets with any of these, like, high-end restaurants and oh, whatnot. Oh, sure, no. Without any doubt, like, I... I don't see necessarily a problem with, like, having to plan out way ahead of time. However, there are ways around having, like, multiple years ahead of time booked out. Yeah. Um, you only allow six months of booking at a time. Yeah, or wide variety of things. <laughs> there's a wide, <laughs> there's a wide, a wide array of strategies that could be implemented into yeah. this. However, it is very heavily implied that part of him and his philosophy is the old school way of doing things which doesn't necessarily lend itself to like getting more people in the door yes but fear not even though he is old school he does have his own line of products to that and as well as instructions does. on how to use them which which does okay cracks me up because as someone who studied architecture does that not sound like frank lloyd wright bullshit out the wazoo Yes and no, but I also appreciate it because Frank Lloyd Wright was still at that era of architecture where, like, 
any of their design secrets or their inspirations they kept close to their chest. Sure. Whereas that's what I think that's why Euro is so accessible to everyone and why he yes. was so influential on like early film viewers and uh, in our, in our generation at least was because and like for home cooks too is because he made everything seem like it was easily done at home. Yes. No, that is one of the things that I appreciate greatly is there's no secrets at all when they're explaining like they they don't hide anything in the kitchen from you like honestly he'd probably tell you the rest like the recipe the secret to his success is the perfectionism that goes into every single detail of the restaurant exactly down to the placement of the silverware exactly yeah which good on him like that i appreciate quite a lot well you mean silverware you mean your fingers Finger- they, they do have chopsticks <laughs> for certain for certain roles yeah and like the during the commentary, the director explained that, like, he would move, like, a sign in the background to get a better shot, and he would come out and immediately move it back, because <laughs> he's like, no, that's not where it goes. <laughs> I don't blame him for that. Yeah, no, this is like, he's got the tiniest little restaurant, and every single aspect of it must be immaculate, must be perfect. Yeah, I don't blame him. Yeah, no, like, that's, that's his whole, that's the whole part of it. That's, like, the whole... I don't want to say gimmick, but, like, that's the whole, like, rigmarole of him and his restaurant is an attention to detail on another scale, on another level. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. Yes. Um, But I do want to bring up, while I was doing a little reading, I came across the article uh, in Eater, Jiro and the Impossible Dream of Authenticity by Bettina Makalintal. Sure. Um, that came back from August of last year, um, in which Michael uh, mentions that Ono's approach to, uh, have, was kind of fetishized yeah. as, as the pinnacle of authenticity of like, this is the only way to make and eat sushi. But yes. here's the thing, because even in the documentary, Jiro does mention that back in his day, he was making sushi no one else made. Yes. And I will, I do think that Jiro and his sons do know and appreciate that like theirs is not like the that way or the highway yeah um there's several different occasions where jiro explains that like no if you work for me you need to have a good palate and a good sense of smell and that means eating good things yes you need to try other things not just try whatever's around don't just like feed yourself standard cook junk Mm -hmm. you need to have a refined palate and that takes practice and practice means eating um, but the documentary doesn't really explain, like, the back logic behind that, like, statement. Yeah. It just kind of presents it and goes on. And there was, like, I remember there being a huge wave of people being like, oh, you have sushi here in, like, Kansas City, Missouri? Well, it's not real sushi, because, like, here we have deep fried rolls that have, like, you know, corn and cream cheese in them. And they're covered <laughs> in barbecue sauce. <laughs> And like yes, yeah. I I totally understand like where those people were coming from, but there was like such a misunderstanding yeah. between this documentary and like a great majority of audience where like it was for a while implied that like he is the greatest sushi chef in the world, no questions asked. Where I think even he himself is like, no, this I do the best this style. Yeah. There are other people who do different styles, and I do not even compare to them. Yeah, and I, I think that's just the fault of the documentary of putting you're on a pedestal and not really, like, going through with its entire attempt of trying to explore history or explore sushi around the world. Because, I mean, even if it had taken a little bit of time, there was a precursor to sushi called... Uh, Funazushi, Funa Zushi, which is a fermented fish in mounds of rice, and I oversimplified it, but that's pretty much the origin of sushi. Is yes, yeah, the sushi we know today isn't even the like, original original sushi. So like the, no. uh, the there there's there's an authenticity in it changing over time through culture, but at the same time, like when you bring something over to the U.S. or to a different country that you can't get the same products or the or same the, items. Or even, like, in Japan, like, there, like, a lot of the, like, side um, viewers that I I watched when looking into this mm-hmm. talk about, like, oh, oh, well, here he does it like it is here in this city and, like, also based off of his upbringing and where he was raised. If you went much farther north, it would look very different because yeah. that's just a different style. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, it's just something I find interesting as someone who explores, like, food history and how things change with their taste. Um, But, yeah, it's just 
it's a fault of the documentary that it it really changed. I I feel a lot what a lot of people's perceptions of this dish would have been when no, it's a I... very narrow minded, then not narrow minded, a perfectionist idea of what sushi should be. Yes, and also like I don't think that there is anything wrong with wanting to explore that perfectionism. No. Um, but I, I do think that not only did it miss, like, misunderstand its viewers and, like, how they would be watching and understanding it, but I think it also misunderstood its own impact into him because yeah. he, he was already, you know, world class. He was already Michelin star. And then after everyone knew about him, well, it, it changes the dynamic of like, oh, I'm in Japan like there is a different there's a different style of travel to hey I want to eat at this specific place because it's on my bucket list or yeah. like because I am like actively going here for his restaurant versus I am traveling. Yeah. And like and those unfortunately those two paths crossed really hard because of this documentary. And it's also part of the reason he lost the Michelin star is because Unfo- the Michelin star is meant to be anyone can enjoy this or as long as you plan ahead of time, but he's so hard to get into that you yes. can't. Yeah. No, it, it makes it impossible for even those who would normally... Tra- like, the the way that Michelin... When I was looking into, like, the Michelin guides and the Michelin stars, the way Michelin um, kind of loosely breaks down its categories is one star is very good in its category, two being excellent cooking worth a detour in its category, and three being exceptional worth a special journey. Yes. And... You can't have a special journey if you can't go. <laughs> no, exactly. And weirdly enough, I've actually, in this month alone, I've watched three movies about cooking. Yes. I, actually, no, I've watched four. Yes, uh, and no, it is it is one of my like favorite subcategories is movies about chefs and cooking, especially because, with the exception of this one, most of them follow a very similar format of like who the chef is, what type of personality they have, the food will change, the location will change, but, like, the rough tumble chef, the back, like, the smoking in the back alley sort of personality, that generally carries through, whereas with Jiro Dreams of Sushi, it shows a completely different side and light to what would normally be, like, a quick food. Maybe documentaries, because we, I, Mirazi, we watch very different movies about eating. This is true. <laughs> to this be fair, to very be true. fair, one of the ones I watched was Burnt, so it does fall under that more... With all the personality of the chef yes. and all that stuff. It's more a drama film, but yeah. No, I, I get that. So, I guess at the end of it, Chris, would you rent, buy, stream, or decline that we ever watched it despite having an audio recording of us watching it? This is kind of tricky because I really like this documentary mm-hmm. and I have rewatched it several times. And you have a very nice copy of it. Yes. And I really enjoyed the director's commentary. Something that was, I didn't listen to. It, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't think it was an hour and 20 some minutes of commentary worth. Okay. But it was good and informative and it did a really nice job of explaining a lot of the micro details in the filming of it that would, would have been lost to me otherwise. Um, so if you can get a hold of that and you're interested at all at in the style and perfectionism that Jiro has, I do recommend buying it for the documentary uh, or the commentary okay. on the documentary because he tr- the director tried very hard to have the same sort of uh, detail attention and perfectionism in the micro uh, when filming. So like shots he tried very hard to do very specifically. He, um, he explains the process of editing it together mm-hmm. and picking who to like ask questions and how lucky they got with who was there to translate and all that sort of stuff. So that like all of that added so much to it for me. However, it is not necessarily worth the extra cost of the Blu-ray. So I think this is a stream for me. Actually, the Blu-ray is cheaper than the DVD now. Well, yeah, but like, you know (laughs) what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't worth the 13 bucks. Yeah. That that's where I kind of sit too is, I wouldn't buy it, but if you have a chance to rent or stream it, I definitely recommend that. But definitely go into it as 
more of an introductory course as mm-hmm. kind of your gateway into the rest of what sushi is. Yes. And, and c- kind of look at it as like, like we talked about, it is ki- it is this pinnacle. There is something yes. special. I don't want to knock knock Euro's work or his no. dedication. There is, is something Im- that is... It is incredibly impressive. Yeah, it's something that's incredible to watch and just see. But the documentary itself is very niche in regards to an overall experience or understanding of sure sure uh, the I, subject I, uh, outside of euro i i don't think if this is your first introduction to japanese culture and sushi both like both of those things separately mm-hmm. i don't think this is necessarily a good starting point for those however it is a very well put together it is very entertaining it is beautiful to watch and it kept my delightfully ADHD husband entertained for a full hour. So <laughs> so there was 20 minutes I was lost to Yes, him. there was. <laughs> but for him, that's pretty damn good. Good. So, good. like, it is worth, like, if it's on, I highly recommend. If it's on streaming still, I highly recommend. If this sort of thing interests you, then I would recommend going ahead and getting a hold of the commentary. Yeah. But, like, I'm, you have to already be in it, you know? Yeah. And I am I mean, I'm in it, but I just, I'm not there for the commentary. I'm just there for what the documentary presents. I totally understand that, that. And that's the thing. It's like, I feel I, a documentary should present no, its subject matter without needing no, director commentary on I, top of it. I 100% think that, like, this would have been better if the director commentary had been in the movie. Uh, like, then incorporated somehow. Because there was a lot of detail and nuances that were really smart, like the picking of the songs and music that went in the background, like picking the shots and explaining the difficulty of getting certain shots, um, explaining who people are in the backgrounds. Yes. Um, (laughs) Explaining himself and his connection to Jiro and to Sushi and Japan. Like, all of that was really great and really useful. But it's not worth it. Like, it's not worth 13 extra dollars Yeah, if this is like your only time watching it. Because it is spoken on top of the movie. It's not like incorporated. You know? Yeah, so basically he took the concept of simplicity and applied it too heavily to the documentary. Yes, 100%. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but anywho, this has been The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Pot, or Microviews. Microviews. Thanks yes. for listening. Peace. Thank you for stopping by this here town of the good, the bad, and the weird. We appreciate your listenership, and if you want more of our takes in your life, feel free to check us out on social media at the good, the bad, and the weird podcast, or TGTBTW for short. As well, if we missed a fact, your favorite part of a movie, or just have a suggestion and want to reach out and say howdy, feel free to email us at TGTBTWpodcast at gmail.com. And feel free to join our Discord at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, where we talk about movies, just share random banter here and there. And always check out our podcasters, streamers, or any other content creator we shout out in our episodes. We really appreciate it. And as always, thank you for listening. Peace.